And if you would, please turn in your Bibles to our scripture passage, our scripture reading, Luke 18, 1 to 8. Luke 18, 1 to 8. And then our sermon passage this morning is 2 Samuel chapter 4, uh, verses 1 to 12. That's the whole chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 4. But again, first we will turn to Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. Brothers and sisters, this is the very word of God. This is the Lord speaking to you. You hear his voice and not the voice of man, the words of the Lord and not my words, as God's word is now read. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused. But afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Now turning to 2 Samuel chapter 4, verses 1 to 12. When Ishbosheth, Saul's son, heard that Abner had died at Hebron, his courage failed, and all Israel was dismayed. Now Saul's son had two men who were captains of raiding bands. The name of one was Baana, and the name of the other Rechab, sons of Rimon, a man of Benjamin from Be'eroth. For Be'eroth also is counted part of Benjamin. The Be'erothites fled to Gitaim and have been sojourners there to this day. Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Now the sons of Rimon, the Be'erothite, Rechab and Ba'ana, set out. And about the heat of the day, they came to the house of Ishbosheth as he was taking his noonday rest. And they came into the midst of the house as if to get wheat. And they stabbed him in the stomach. Then Rechab and Ba'ana, his brother, escaped. When they came into the house, as he lay on his bed, in his bedroom, they struck him and put him to death and beheaded him. They took his head and went by the way of the Arabah all night and brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron. And they said to the king, Here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. The Lord has avenged my lord the king this day on Saul and on his offspring. But David answered Rechab and Ba'anah, his brother, the sons of Ramon, the Be'erothite, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity, when one told me, Behold, Saul is dead, and thought he was bringing good news, I seized him and killed him at Ziklag, which was the reward I gave him for his news. How much more, when wicked men have killed a righteous man in his own house on his bed, shall I not now require his blood at your hand and destroy you from the earth? And David commanded his young men, and they killed them, and cut off their hands and feet, and hanged them beside the pool at Hebron. And they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the tomb of Abner at Hebron. This ends the reading of God's holy, infallible, inerrant, and inspired word. Let us pray. Our most gracious God and Father, we have arrived at, once again, at a very difficult and challenging passage, especially to 21st century ears. We have accounts of great brutality. Of course, we're not unaware of instances of great brutality in our own land and around the world in this current day. And yet, dear Lord, we are unaccustomed to the kind of justice being meted out which we've just heard about in this passage. And so our sensibilities may a bit, be a bit rattled. Our sensitivities may be a bit exposed. 
We pray that you would give us wisdom, that you'd give us discernment, that you would guide us by your spirit into understanding. We pray, O oh Lord, because we know that your word teaches us about you and what you have done. We pray that you would indeed cause us to glorify your holy name as your word is preached. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. As I was looking back uh, and remembering the last time that we were in the book of 2 Samuel, I realized it's been a little while since we were here. And so I think that a refresher on what has taken place up to this point may be helpful for us to get our bearings. So just to go back through things just a little bit, you'll remember that in chapter 1, David received news of Saul's death, what had taken place at the end of 1 Samuel. And when he heard about the death of Saul from this Amalekite who claimed responsibility for Saul's death, David ordered that the man be executed. It was very swift and severe justice, and yet proper justice, even if indeed this man was guilty of killing Saul. Afterward, in chapter 2, David was anointed king of Judah, and Abner, Saul's top general, made Saul's son Ishbosheth king of Israel. And then in chapter 3, Abner defected to David's side. And when he did so, he promised that he was going to bring all of Israel with him. But later in chapter 3, because of a grudge that went back to 1 Samuel, Joab murdered Abner. And so a great amount of political and palace intrigue have been covered in just a few short chapters. And chapter 4 brings even more intrigue our way as two men take it upon themselves to murder Saul's remaining son, the king of Israel. And no doubt these men, like the Amalekite messenger, expected some kind of reward for, from David for their service to him, their great service in their own minds. Now I suppose that one could argue that they did receive their reward, but it certainly wasn't the kind of reward that they were looking for. And this causes us to, to think for a moment, to stop and to reflect. Try as we might to be cautious in what we do. There are times in our lives when we are so focused on our goal, on what we want, that we can't anticipate the unintended consequences that may happen as a result. You probably have experienced this in your life. You, you become tunnel visioned. You can only see the thing that you want, that thing that you've set before your eyes, and you cannot see the way that your actions may lead to unintended consequences. And so apparently it had never crossed these men's, the minds of these two men that their heroic actions would result in their own executions. Though they might possibly have guessed, they probably should have guessed at the possibility that this could happen if they were aware of recent history. It's possible that they thought they were bringing about justice. Maybe they hoped that David would see it that way, but the unintended consequence for them was that they received justice themselves, swift justice from David. And a little over a thousand years later, a group of people thought that they were bringing about justice upon another man. But they did not understand that what they meant for evil, God intended for good. They thought they were putting someone to death who deserved it because he posed a great threat to their religious system. But the unintended consequence for them, not for God, of course, was that by putting Jesus Christ to death, he would make atonement for our sins. And so I'd ask you to, to think about this, to consider this thought as we make our way through the sermon today. What might be unintended consequences for us are not unintended for God who uses all things to bring about the salvation of his people. Again, what might be unintended consequences for us are not unintended for God, who uses all things to bring about the salvation of his people. Well, the sermon today is a two-parter. The first part, Saul in shambles. And the second, Davidic determination. So again, the first part of the sermon today is Saul in shambles, the second Davidic determination. So let's look at the first part now. Consider that Saul in shambles. The last section of chapter 3 gave us David's reaction to Abner's murder. He was mournful of Abner's death. He understood that Abner, in one sense, received consequences for his actions in murdering the brother of Joab. Joab. 
And in verse 1 of chapter 4, we read of Saul's son Ishbosheth's and Israel's reaction to Abner's death. Verse 1 says that when Ishbosheth heard of Abner's death at Hebron, his courage failed, and all of Israel was dismayed at this news. Literally, verse 1 says that Ishbosheth's hands trembled. They became weak at the news of Abner's murder. You remember that Abner was the one who set Ishbosheth up as king of Israel after Saul had died. He set him up in opposition to David, who was soon to become king of Judah. Now, the author of 2 Samuel doesn't include Ishbosheth's reaction to Abner's death to somehow justify Ishbosheth's murder as if he deserved it, but I think it does give us an indication of just how weak the house of Saul had become at this point in its history. It was in shambles. The king is weak and fearful, and all Israel seems to follow his lead. They are dismayed, terrified, to hear of Abner's murder. But remember that Abner had turned on them. He was a traitor. But he was the strongest of Saul's former generals. And so Ishbosheth might have realized that if Abner wasn't safe from assassination, neither was he. And the people of Israel, by Abner's death, were reminded of just how weak they really were. Now, verse 2 introduces the two men who will become the, the focus of the second half of this brief chapter. They were sons of a man named Rimon. One was named Ba'ana, and the other's name was Rechab. They were from the tribe of Benjamin. They lived in the town of Be'eroth, which, as verse 2 says, was counted part of Benjamin. Now, the location of Be'eroth is not known with perfect certainty, but it appears to have been about eight and a half miles northwest of Jerusalem, so not too far from, from Judah. The author adds a historical note in verse 3 so that readers don't assume that these two men were Canaanites instead of Israelites. He says the original inhabitants of Beroth, the Canaanites, they fled to Gitaim and remained there up to the time that 2 Samuel was written. So these men are Benjaminites. They're not from the inhabitants of the land when the Israelites came in. These men had been captains in Saul's army. They were trusted men of Saul's very own tribe. And this further underscores how far the house of Saul had fallen. And that leads us now to verse 4. Now some have a question why the note on Jonathan's son Mephibosheth is mentioned here. It seems to be out of place. He's not mentioned again for several more chapters. And some assume that an editor later on that they added it in. Well, think about this for a moment. I think this justifies why the author of 2 Samuel included this note about Mephibosheth, even though it doesn't seem like it belongs there. Mephibosheth would have been Ishbosheth's successor in the event of his death, except for the fact that he had been crippled, as verse 4 tells us. When he was five years old, his wet nurse found out about the deaths of Jonathan and Saul, and when she heard the news, she picked up Mephibosheth, and in her haste to flee, she dropped him, he fell, and both of his feet were crippled. He, he was injured for the rest of his life. Now, this nurse, of course, never intended to hurt Mephibosheth. Quite the opposite. She was trying to protect him. She was fleeing. She knew that his grandfather and his father had been killed, and perhaps she wondered if he might be next. And so Saul is dead. Jonathan is dead. Abner is now dead. Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, is crippled. And Ishbosheth, the king of Israel, is terrified. And it only gets worse for the house of Saul. Verse 5 says that these two sons of Remon, Rechab and Ba'ana, they set out during the hottest part of the day when the king and most others would have been enjoying their afternoon siesta. They were taking a nap. It was the heat of the day. And verses 6 and 7 say that when they went into the king's house, they stabbed him in the stomach as he lay on his bed in his bedroom. And in order to prove to David what they had done, they decapitated Ishbosheth, and they took his head with them when they left. Now, these two men, they're traveling from Beroth, which is eight and a half miles northwest of Jerusalem, and they're going to where Ishbosheth is across the Jordan River on the east side of the Jordan River to Mahanaim. This was a premeditated, well thought out in certain senses plan. It was not spontaneous. They had hours and hours to consider what they were doing, hours and hours to change their mind if they had wanted to. This was a brazen, heinous act. And if the Septuagint is correct, and 
there's debate over whether it is. Some of you may have a footnote at the, the bottom of the page in your Bibles that gives a, a, an alternate reading, or an extended reading uh, from the Septuagint. If it's correct, then there, it was made even worse by these men committing the murder with a female doorkeeper asleep in the house as well. As we'll see, these men thought that they were doing David a favor. They most likely thought that they would be appropriately compensated for their effort with some special place in their new king's army. But that, unexpectedly for them, was not to be. The house of Saul was already in shambles. And by taking advantage of that, these men had made it even worse. And that leads us to the second point of the sermon this morning, Davidic determination. Verse 8 contains the conclusion of a sentence that began in verse 7. The men traveled all night and took Ishbosheth's head to David at Hebron. Now this parallels, but in reverse, the valiant men of Jabesh Gilead. You remember those men. They traveled all night to Beth Shan and found Saul's and Jonathan's bodies hanging and took them back to Jabesh Gilead. Theirs was a noble, honorable mission. Rechab's and Ba'anaz was the opposite. And when they came before him, they said to the king, they said to David, here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. The Lord has avenged my Lord the king this day on Saul and on his offspring. Now in Dale Davis's commentary on this passage in a section titled Theology Provides an Excellent Cloak for Evil. Think about that for a second. Theology provides an excellent cloak for evil. He writes this, we must, we must be aware. When we explain things theologically, we may be simply using God, using him as an argument, manipulating him for our convenience to keep from submitting to his grace or to his law. These men were using theology to justify the murder of a man who lay asleep on his bed during a noonday nap. Rechab and Ba'ana were telling David that Yahweh had used them as instruments of justice to bring down judgment on the house of Saul. They appealed to what they assumed would be David's bitterness over having been pursued by Saul for years. It's possible that they thought David had been nursing a deep hatred for Saul and his household between the time of Saul's death and that day. But they forgot about this simple fact regarding David, that he would not lift a hand against the Lord's anointed. David never, though he had opportunity, multiple opportunities, to take Saul's life, he would not do it. And what's more, he had a deep and profound friendship with Saul's son, Jonathan. And the next couple of verses show that what the men hoped David would say, how they hoped he would react, was simply not the case. He replies, beginning in verse 9, As Yahweh lives, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity. Let's stop there for a moment. That's a fairly ambiguous introduction to David's response to what these two men have just told him. And at this point, if it was dragged out, the men have no reason to think it's not going to end well for them. As Yahweh lives, who delivered me always out of the hand of adversity. Of course, it could be taken the other way as well. Yahweh has always delivered me out of the hand of adversity. Why do you think you have to be the ones to deliver me? Now, David continues in verse 10, When one told me, Behold, Saul is dead, and thought he was bringing good news, I seized him and killed him at Ziklag, which was the re reward I gave him for his news. Now, what David doesn't say there is that that man, that, that Amalekite, he had said that he was the one who killed Saul. And so the only proper response to what this man had told David was that man's own execution. And so these two men... Rechab and Ba'ana, they were sons of Rimon the Barathite, as, as the text reminds us several times. They had conceived this plan. They walked hours and hours to Mahanaim. They made sure to arrive at Ishbosheth's house in the middle of the day when they knew he would be sleeping. And then, after they had murdered him, they walked all these many hours to Hebron. They were so certain of the final outcome. They were so certain that they would ingratiate themselves to David, that they would be given positions within his ranks, that it never crossed their minds in all of that time, that it could all go pear-shaped when they got to David and talked with him. And verse 10 gives them 
their first indication that things might not end as planned. David makes reference to the last time that an alleged killer of the king turned messenger brought him news of the death of the king of Israel and what happened to said messenger. That messenger wanted a reward, and the reward he got was being seized and killed at Ziklag. Now, Rechab and, and Ba'ana might not have been the sharpest tools on the workbench, but by now they have probably picked up that it's not going how they had hoped. And David continues his response in verse 11, How much more, when wicked men have killed a righteous man in his own house on his bed, shall I not, uh, shall I, shall I not now require his blood at your hand and destroy you from the earth? The Amalekite, from a people who were radically opposed to Israel and to Judah, he's making this argument from the lesser to the greater. If he's going to do this to an Amalekite, how much more will he do to these men who should have known better and who killed a righteous man in his own house on his own bed? Well, that escalated quickly, and the escalation continues. David doesn't pause. Verse 12 says that David commanded his young men, and they killed the two men. They cut off their hands and their feet and hung their bodies by the pool at Hebron. And they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the tomb of Abner at Hebron. They killed these men. They cut off their hands, the hands which were the agents of the murder. They cut off their feet, which were so swift both to bloodshed but also to return or to come to David and tell him all about it. Because you see, the only way that David could have known the, the details about what took place inside that house, which he did know, was if these, these men were, in a sense, bragging to him about what they had done about how they had gone into his house, stabbed him in the stomach, cut off his head. And so they were hung by the pool at Hebron as a warning to other people, but also to show this is what happens even to people who attack the king of Israel. And so there probably were political considerations behind David's swiftness in carrying out justice. If Israel and Judah were to be united with him as king, he would have to show in a very clear way that he would not tolerate such a heinous act against Israel's king. But we cannot forget the fact that David did have a deep love for the household of Saul. He loved Jonathan. And he would not stand by and allow the house of Saul to be attacked in the way that it had been. It also showed all of Israel and Judah how David would reign, ensuring that justice would be upheld. Again, referring to Dale Davis, he says in his commentary that every instance of justice in David's reign points to even greater justice that we will have from David's greater descendant. Brothers and sisters, there will be justice even if the earthly authorities get it all wrong, which they so often do in this life. Vengeance is the Lord. He will repay as we saw in Jesus' parable of the persistent widow in Luke 18, if a human judge will give justice, albeit grudgingly, to a woman who persistently begged him for justice, how much more will the Lord give justice to his elect who pray to him day and night? God will give justice to his people. Now here's the thing. And some of you have been on the receiving end of injustice. You've waited patiently for the civil authorities to bring about justice that's, that never comes. You may know those who have suffered for years waiting for justice to be carried out, to be given. It may not happen according to our timing because God is patiently waiting for the full number of his people, the elect, to be gathered in before the Lord comes in judge, judgment. But justice will be given. On that day... There's no chance to call for a do-over. On that day when Jesus Christ returns, there will be no opportunity for those who have refused to bend their knee to him in faith to do so. God is patient. And so sometimes in this life, it means that we wait. But here's the other way to look at it. For many of you, not most perhaps, but for many of you, there might have been times where you deserved God's swift judgment as well, right? For all of us, we deserve eternal damnation. But for some of us, we've done things in our past that we'd rather not talk about, perhaps, that we're deserving of, of either swift judgment from the Lord or swift judgment from the civil authorities. And for whatever reason, it didn't happen. 
We were deserving of that, but we didn't receive it in every case. But God is patient. He's been patient with you. We should expect him to be patient with others. Things did not go the way that Rakab and Ba'ana had intended. They didn't see the unintended consequences their actions would have, and they forfeited their lives for it. The Jewish and Roman authorities thought that they were putting to death a rabble-rouser and a troublemaker when they executed Jesus. They did not intend for his death to be a sacrifice for many for the forgiveness of sins. And it was by their unintended consequence, although it was certainly intended by God the Father, that we are saved. Another unintended consequence, unintended by us, is that Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross for all of our sins. Now, we don't sin in order for Jesus to have suffered, and yet that is the case. He did suffer the just, just punishment for our sins. And so it's in the cross that we see God's perfect justice carried out to punish sinners. On the cross, we see the punishment that we deserve for our sins. But we see it poured out upon God the Son. He was punished in our place. And so the day of Christ's crucifixion was a day of judgment and a day of mercy. And the, Christ, the day of Christ's return will be the same. It will be a day of judgment for all who have refused to believe in Jesus Christ. But it will be a day of mercy for everyone who does believe. And on that day, we will truly see that no consequence was unintended by God. But that he has ordained all things to work for his glory and for our good. And brothers and sisters, that is good news. And it's for that reason that we can look forward to that day and not fear it with dread. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we are thankful to you, dear Lord. We're thankful that all of the unintended consequences of our sin did not come to pass for us. And yet they did come to pass for the Lord Jesus. We are thankful, Lord, that he willingly took our sins upon him when he hung on that tree. When he hung and was humiliated before the great crowd of people who had called for his death. We are grateful, dear Lord, that though it was unintended on our part, it was intended by you. But we pray that we would be aware, that we would be cognizant of the effects that our actions have. We pray, dear Lord, that we would not freely sin without a care. We pray, Lord, that we would remind ourselves that it is our sin that caused Christ's death. And we pray, Lord, that we, as a result, as a consequence, would live lives filled with gratitude, filled with joy, filled with hope, at the knowledge of the salvation that you have won for us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.